Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Adam Mikolajczyk. I am a transplant hepatologist, which is a liver physician at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the Community Education Committee for the American Society of Transplantation. And we're thrilled uh, to be able to have a webinar today to speak to you about uh, living donor liver transplant. And so I'm joined by an amazing panel. So um, I'd like to ask each of you to, to introduce yourselves and how you're related to living donor liver transplant. Uh, so we'll start with you, uh, Dr. Samstein. So uh, hello, and um, thank you for uh, letting me be a part of this uh, panel. Um, uh, I'm a uh, liver and transplant surgeon. Uh, working at New York Presbyterian and Weill Cornell. And uh, I worked closely with a group of um, nurses, um, social workers, physicians, and surgeons um, to develop a really uh, um, comprehensive resource um, and um, that we're going to talk about today. Thank you. And Diane? Hi, I'm Diane lapointe Rudow. I am a nurse practitioner and I'm the director of the Living Donor Program at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today and thank you for inviting me. Um, I've spent my career working with living donors and uh, I think that um, talks like this are really important because I think being prepared for living donation is, is so important and anything we can do as a community to help that, I, I'm, feel excited to be a part of. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, Rambo. Hello, greetings, everyone. I'm Rambo Tran. I'm so incredibly thankful to be a part of this group in this chat. Uh, I am Rambo Tran, just like the movie. I am uh, currently serving in the United States Army. It's stationed here in Boston as the medical station commander for the recruiting command in Boston and Rhode Island. I am connected to this call because I am a living liver donor that uh, I was able to donate my liver 10 years ago to my father. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we'll get started with the uh, question and answer portion of the panel. Uh, so Dr. Samstein, um, what is living donor liver transplant? So living donor liver transplant is where we take a portion of someone's liver uh, who is alive and we divide the liver into two pieces and the one of the pieces is removed. Uh, so the other piece is never never removed, never really touched uh, from the donor. The, the other piece is removed and implanted in place of a diseased liver uh, for the purposes of transplantation. The entire uh, diseased liver is removed. Thank you. Uh, Diane, who, who can be a living donor? I mean, generally anyone who's healthy can, can consider living donation. The living donor team does a very extensive evaluation to make sure that they're healthy. Um, but in, typically it's somebody who is a family member or a friend or somebody that knows the, the person who needs the transplant, um, who is a compatible blood type. Um, typically they're between the ages of 18 and 60, but in, there are some programs who will consider very healthy people over 60. Um, they can have chronic medical problems like kidney disease or liver disease or heart disease. Um, they shouldn't have diabetes or um, active cancers. Um, and, and also sometimes if they have certain viruses like active hepatitis C, they're not able to donate. Um, also, obese patients can't donate usually because it's really not safe for them. Um, and people with uncontrolled mental illness or substance abuse. So in general, healthy people should consider it and they can call and talk to the transplant program. And then together they can decide if this is something that's safe for them to do. Dr. Samstein, wh why is living donation a good option? What are the advantages of considering living donation? If you need a transplant, the, e the easiest and often the fastest way to get transplanted is a living donor. Then living donation enables that transplantation in an expedited way. Living donation provides a reliable way of getting transplanted when you need it. So that's the primary kind of medical reason for advantages. Living donation enables a, a family because usually um, transplantation is not just about the recipient, but the entire family um, 
to be organized in a way that's optimal. And I think we all want medical care that is delivered in an optimal time. Thank you. That's an uh, awesome answer. Um, before we move forward any further, um, Dr. Samstein had referenced this a little bit earlier, but Diane and um, Dr. Samstein, you worked on a new resource for patients to address questions similar to the ones that we are discussing today. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about this and show us some of these features, Diane? Sure, I'd be happy to. I'm going to share my screen. So um, so this is the, the toolkit. It, you can find it at livingdonortoolkit.com. And it's a website that um, has three toolkits. They have a living donor financial toolkit, a living donor kidney toolkit and a living donor liver toolkit. And so we'll talk about the liver one. The, the liver one was designed by a group of people who are experts in living donation and work in the field for a very long time. There are all these chapters that you can see. And each chapter was thought to be important information for someone to know as they're going through their living donation journey and things to consider as you're deciding whether you want to be a living donor. And so each chapter has a topic. And then if you go, I'll go into this one, the surgery, for instance, there is uh, um, information that you can read about the surgery, as well as the references where we got this information. You can read it on the website, or you can download it in English or in Spanish to show your family members or friends or, or use to think about it. And so when you download it, this is what the toolkit looks like. And so there's lots of information um, that will help you decide um, and learn about living donation. Thank you so much. Um, Rambo, I'd like to switch gears uh, to discuss your story a little bit. Why, why did you choose to donate? So um, to choose it is, is a very interesting word to say. Honestly, I was incredibly um, honored and also in, to, to donate from my father. So 10 years ago, I had the horrible call that no one really wants to get that a family member. Uh, my sister actually called me up saying, hey, you know, Rambo, I got to tell you something. I don't know if dad called you up or not or told you, but dad has cancer. And that was a complete shock and awe for all of us. Um, I remember at the very moment just being frozen in time and just kind of processing everything through because my father has always been my mentor, my superhero. He's been a single parent for my sister and I, and he's always been there. However, with the culture that we grew up as being a Vietnamese background, uh, he was always very stubborn per se uh, to get into help and care. So by the time it was already been acknowledged that he had liver cancer and affected both his left and right lobe. It was to the point where we had to take drastic measures. Uh, myself, my sister, uh, we did a little research. We found out that there was a program available at UMass Hospital in Worcester uh, that was able to do the transplant with Dr. Bazorg today, which is our, our, our saving grace. And it was hands down, like, I was the best uh, candidate uh, for my father because one health career, I was able to get support from my organization, the United States Army, uh, even though I'm actively serving they allowed me to still pursue that as long as I can return back as a soldier and do my basic duties. So um, to, 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 be, to, to be able to uh, donate for my father, uh, that was hands down the, the one choice I was always going for. Thank you so much for, for sharing that inspiring story, which has such a, such a happy ending, and we're so grateful for that. And kind of dovetailing off of that uh, previous question, what is the typical recovery time? Uh, for someone who donates a portion of their liver. Okay. So, so typically a person will be in the hospital anywhere between four and seven days, depending on the, the lobe that they donated and just their individual case. Um, but they're encouraged to walk and move around, you know, within the, a day of surgery. And it's, it's actually important for recovery to, to be moving around in the hospital. Um, they'll be getting um, pain management in the hospital because the first couple of days, there is a significant amount of pain. Full recovery can take up to three or four months. But that being said, each week you see improvement. Most people who have a desk job are back to work between two and six weeks. If you have a very physical job, you know, I'm interested to hear what Rambo has to say being in the military, but sometimes it, it could be a few months before you're really back to full duty in, in your work. Um, you won't need any long-term medications, but you will need pain medication in the short term. You know, the liver regenerates um, over uh, several weeks to months. And while it's regenerating, there's overwhelming fatigue. And so I think that's really noticed in, in the early post-operative period. 
Um, you also might have some dietary restrictions at the beginning. You know, often the surgery requires the removal of a gallbladder. And so low fat diet is recommended just from so that your, your stomach isn't upset and that you don't have a lot of diarrhea early on. Um, and there also will be a period of abstinence from alcohol as the liver regenerates healthy. Thank you so much. So per perfect uh, segue. So um, Rambo, if you could please share, if you don't mind, uh, just a little bit ab about your own recovery. Oh, recovery, Diane, you, you were spot on of curiosity of how my recovery was being for my service in the military. So uh, just first and foremost, my recovery, I think, was uh, not of standard uh, typical patients because prior to going to recovery, I would just return back from my third tour in Iraq and I just finished uh, a marathon with my wife down at Disney. So, you know, incredibly healthy, you know, just, just in that positive uh, combat physique, and then going through the procedure, uh, it took about two and a half months for me, to be honest, to recover back. Now, granted, most of us behind the curtains that really evolved my recovery and helped uh, the whole process was my incredible wife, my family, my support group. Uh, she was there throughout every single moment, provided, made sure I stayed on that healthier diet because of the gallbladder removal, dietary restrictions, and she was there to say, you know, hey, honey, maybe you should not move your heavy Harley around because you can't lift things over five pounds in the first week or so. Or, hey, maybe you should listen to the surgeon and not do all these physical fitness. So she kept me regulated. And that's most important of all for my recovery process. Diane, uh, I had a question. What, who, who pays for the transplant? That's a very common question that we get asked. So that's a great question. You know, the um, actual workup for the donation, um, the surgery, and, and the hospital stay is covered by the recipient's insurance. And, and some follow-up is care is also covered by the, the recipient's insurance. But there are things that aren't covered. So if you need labs, you know, a year later, or if you need uh, a hernia repair three years later. There's a lot of questions as to who would pay for that. It's not always the recipient's insurance that would pay for that. And so it's strongly encouraged that people have their own health insurance. Um, there's also travel costs. And, and if you were supposed to get a colonoscopy because you're over 50 and you didn't get one, you might need to get your own health maintenance on your, on your own insurance. And so there are things that, that cost money. Um, and there is financial assistance available. Um, but I think it's a good idea to start off thinking about what your expenses would be. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just go back to that um, toolkit. So, so this is the financial toolkit. And I think it's a really good um, resource for you to kind of look at um, because there are a bunch of chapters here to help you. There's how to talk to your employer and what things you need from your employer when you're considering living donation, how to keep your insurance, the National Living Donor Assistance Center, which is a center that provides travel and lost wage coverage for certain living donors. There's federal and state laws about living donation. There's ways to fundraise and there's various, uh, there's information about the military and living donation. And so this is a great resource. And the first thing that I think everyone should look at is the worksheet. And so if you go here, there's a worksheet that's been developed by uh, social workers and financial coordinators for you to kind of look at the things that, that possibly you will need to spend on during the donation time, how much everyone, everything will cost. So you can really decide for yourself if this is something that, that, that's feasible. And if not, speak to the social worker, because there are a lot of resources available that you just have to kind of talk to the social worker about it and know it. Um, but all the major medical things are covered by the recipient. Truly fantastic uh, resource. Thank you for walking us through that. Do, does somebody need to know the person that they're donating to? That's a good question. So no, you don't have to know the person. I mean, typically, the people who come forward to, to donate do know the recipient, and they have some sort of an emotional bond with the recipient, because it is big surgery, it's a long recovery. And so there are not a lot of strangers who come forward. But there are programs around the country that consider strangers. We These strangers we call non-directed donors, and they call a transplant program, and then the program has a mechanism to match them with an appropriate recipient. Um, not every center does this, and so if you are 
are somebody who wants to consider non-directed donation, um, you know, it, it can sometimes be challenging, but, you know, you would look for bigger centers, centers that have been around for a longer period of time um, so that you can find an appropriate place. Wonderful. Thank you. And Dr. Samstein, um, does uh, for our female um, uh, patients or family members of patients who, who may be listening, does uh, living donation affect um, fertility and chances of becoming pregnant in the future? Yeah, I think this is a really important question. Um, the average age of donors is um, somewhere uh, around 40. Um, and as Diane mentioned earlier, um, the range for most donors is between the ages of 18 and 60. So obviously for many donors, they're in a period of time where um, they are able to get pregnant and that's an important decision within the context of their family. There haven't been that many studies um, uh, for people who have gotten pregnant after liver donation. But most liver donors can get pregnant and have healthy pregnancies after donation. Um, research shows that uh, that people who have been liver donors are more likely to have had a C-section um, when, um, when they get pregnant after donation. Um, and they're more likely to have anxiety about getting pregnant. But overall, um, most living liver donors have had successful and healthy pregnancies delivering healthy babies. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, and Rambo, um, as, as we kind of wrap up uh, today's session, um, anything that you wish you had known going into the process um, that you didn't, uh, that you'd like to share for everybody listening? Oh, absolutely. So to be honest, like going through the whole process, you know, all every single staff member that we met with was incredibly thorough. Uh, but to be completely frank, all our emotions going through uh, being a donation from my father's care and recovery and possibly to be even a, a a candidate to donate was uh, overpowering. So having this tool set, uh, toolkit here is incredible. So you can actually look and review. Um, 10 years ago, like I said, like just reviewing some quick documents, talking to the social workers, talking to all the staff of the transplant team, it was, you know, in one year out another is more like, what can I do? When can we do this? Uh, but now having the resources to provide a little more understanding going into it. And also uh, the recovery process, the recovery from my father, the, the recipient of my liver, a couple of days after the donation uh, to be able to go from my uh, bedside to his bedside and seeing how his livelihood came back full charge. The jaundice was gone. His mentally and physically, he was just recharged. It was incredible. Um, so the, like the recovery on just not just the donor, but also recipient, it was absolutely fantastic. Something I obviously didn't know that it was going to happen so quickly. Thank you so much. And, and uh, that, that really concludes our, our event for today. Thank you to, to each of our, our panelists and um, we'd like to encourage everybody watching this uh, to submit um, questions during our uh, Facebook Live event. Um, to each of the panelists who will be present as well, if other questions that you may have were not addressed um, during this Q&A portion. And so on behalf of everybody at the American Society of Transplantation, thank you for participating, and we look forward to keeping you engaged at uh, future events. Thank you.